So good afternoon to all of you. My name is Marco Teixeira. I am the global coordinator of the program for the implementation of Doha Declaration. And before you start the meeting, allow me to provide you a few information regarding this event. This event will, the video will be recorded and the recording will be available in our website and will be shared with the registered participants. And please note that cameras and microphones will be only activated for speakers and moderators. All other participants should submit their queries, comments, or any questions using the chat room function. It is also available simultaneous interpretation into Arabic, Russian, and Spanish, and is provided by, and you can select any of those three languages by clicking on the bottom floor. There is obviously the bottom of your screen, the left side, and then you select the language that you want to listen and accompany this event. The floor option is basically the original sound of the speaker. I will ask also our panelists and our speakers to take, when they are taking the floor, to switch the cameras on and then obviously sounds, and also when they finish to switch on. Now, if I may, I would like formally to welcome all the participants and the distinguished speakers for this event, and we will start the event now. Uh, the objectives of this meeting and this event are basically to share the findings of our UNODC program lineup lead-up that was implemented in the past four years, and also to share the good international practices that we are aware of. Presenting also uh, global evidence how support-based intervention can effectively reduce youth crime, violence, drug use, and to showcase some of our examples are also part of the objectives of this meeting. And finally, highlight some solid methodologies measuring the impact of sports-based intervention. And without further ado, I have a great pleasure to introduce Mrs. Candice Welsh, Deputy Director of our Division of Operations from UNODC. And obviously, Ms. Candice, it's always a pleasure to have you with us, to have your support and have obviously, obviously your political support in our work. Candice, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this event on the impact of sport in preventing youth violence, crime, and drug use. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today with special thanks to His Excellency, Mr. Sultan Salmin Al-Mansouri, the ambassador of the state of Qatar to the UN. The contribution of sport to development, peace, the promotion of tolerance and respect, and the empowerment of young people was recognized in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Because of its mandate to prevent and address crime, UNODC's work strongly focuses on Goal 16 of the Sustainable Development Agenda, on peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. We also attach great importance to promoting crime prevention practices, which are informed by evidence. Sport can be effective in addressing both risk factors and protective factors linked to the victimization of young people and their engagement with violence and crime. Sport offers a rewarding alternative to engaging in criminal behavior. It can provide a sense of belonging and an outlet for emotions. More importantly, it offers a tool for providing informal education, teaching life skills, and promoting social inclusion. However, the positive effects of sport in preventing violence and crime are not automatic. And we are here today to examine what can work and why, thereby contributing to the global evidence base. As part of UNODC's response to the Doha Declaration, which was adopted at the 2015 UN Crime Congress and which requested states to promote the rule of law and to actively engage young people in crime prevention efforts, UNODC developed with the generous support of Qatar, the global program for the implementation of the Doha Declaration. One part of this program is the UNODC Youth Crime Prevention Through Sport Initiative that promotes awareness of the power of sport and sport-based learning to help young people stay away from crime and violence. Within this initiative, we offer technical support to member states 
to use support as a vehicle to build youth and community resilience. The Line Up Live Up Life Skills Training Program in particular is intended to help young people resist pressure to engage in crime and violence. It allows them to practice tolerance, develop their self-esteem, and other valuable personal and social skills. Monitoring and evaluation and impact assessment studies are an integral part of the Line Up Live Up program and activities in line with UN standards and norms on crime prevention, as well as the office's commitment to evidence-based responses and informed public policies. After four years of piloting the Line Up Live Up program in 12 countries across the world, we are proud to present today a new publication entitled Youth Crime Prevention Through Sport, Insights from the UNODC Line Up Live Up Pilot Program. It captures the results and lessons learned based on the analysis of monitoring and evaluation data. The publication highlights promising results, noting the positive changes in the knowledge and attitudes of many youth who participated in the Line Up Live Up Program. With 97% of the participating youth who responded to a survey reporting that they learn new skills that they can use in their daily lives. The guide also points at the importance of enhancing program design and adaptation to the local context and of investing in the capacity of trainers to ensure proper delivery of the program. Recommendations for improving program assessment and the sustainability of results are also provided and will be elaborated on during the presentations during today's event. Allow me to also emphasize that UNODC work on crime prevention through sport also responds to the resolution adopted in 2019 by the UN General Assembly, which calls for the integration of sport into crime prevention strategies and for sharing good practices on the effective use of sport in this context. In December 2019, UNODC organized an expert group meeting in Bangkok, back when we could still hold expert group meetings in persons, where international experts from around the world discussed good practices and developed recommendations on integrating sport into crime prevention and criminal justice strategies. The report of that meeting will be presented in May this year to the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Experts have, among other recommendations, pointed to the need to promote and facilitate effective research to broaden the evidence base of crime prevention interventions that use sport. Dear participants, in the words of the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, we must make prevention our priority, be it in the context of conflict or other threats to development and well being. Your expert advice on how we can use sport effectively to address the causal factors of crime and violence will be crucial in strengthening the crime prevention efforts of countries and the international community at large. UNODC remains highly committed to working with its partners and helping to leverage sport to do just this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Director. Uh, Candice, obviously, you are part of building success with us, so it's much appreciated, your presence and your words. And we could not start better than contextualizing where we are, where we want to go, and you actually put the dots where it should be. But success is created with another ingredient, and I want, and I have the privilege to announce the presence of His Excellency, the Ambassador uh, Sultan al Masuri, which is the Ambassador of State of Qatar to the United Nations in Vienna. Your Excellency, the State of Qatar is key for building success with us. And of course, your presence is for us a symbol of your commitment. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. Deputy Director, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to participate in this event on the impact of sport in preventing youth violence, crime, and drunk. This is one of the most important components of Doha Declaration Global Program. During more than five years, the youth crime prevention through sport pillar registered significant achievement in enhancing the capacity of member states by using the sport for empowering youth and strengthening their life skill to make positive in their own lives 
and their committees within the context of accelerating the achievement of sustainable development goals. Also, the youth crime prevention through sport activities were successful in raising the awareness of the international communities on the role of sport in keeping youth from, the, from becoming involved in a crime, as well as the use of power of sport as a tool of peace and uh, dialogues among civilizations. In my country, state of Qatar, we realized in an early stages the importance role of sport in preventing crimes and promoting economic and social development and shared with the Qatar vision 2030. Thus, Qatar established the Ministry of Sport and Culture to achieve these goals, as well as promoting a better future for the Qatari societies. And these common ties, such as unity of history, environment, places, heritage, hopes, aspirations, and interest in addition to the role of sport. In order to raise awareness and the practice of the impact of the sport for all, Qatar Sport for All Federation was established to increase the numbers of participants in Qatari society who exercise regularly and spreading sport culture in general. Besides, over the past 40 years, Qatar has been able to become a proactive player in contributing strongly to sport activities at the regional and international level, including organizing regional and international competitions. Qatar hosted some of the most prom prominent regional and global sporting competitions the, the, lot, the least, latest of which will be the 2022 uh, FIFA World Cup. As we approach the end of the Doha Declaration Global Program, there is a need to build up on the legacy and the achievement of youth crime prevention through sports com components. Here comes the role of all of us to engage in partnership with governments sports organization and civil society to disseminate the benefit of a sport as a crime prevention factors generators of social capital helping to mobilize the community by promoting involvement togetherness and teamwork as well as supporting sports culture with the community Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's always reassuring to have your presence, to have the state of Qatar support and the vision also towards the future. Uh, I mentioned the winning aspect of having key partners, of setting the stage, but also there's another ingredient for having a winning situation, which is having good players. A winning team needs good winning players. And I'm going to pass the floor now to one of our winning players. So I will do with pleasure and over for the rest of the section to my colleague, Georgia Dimitropolo. She is the UNODC Crime Prevention Criminal Justice Officer and is our team leader for the Youth Crime Prevention Zoo Sport that will also guide us through other part of a winning team, which is our actors, our beneficiaries, and our partners that are also joining this event. And we're reaching almost 300 participants. So, Georgia, thank you for being in our winning team. So over to you and to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Candice, also for being with us. I would like also then to welcome our participants and our speakers. And um, allow me before uh, having a short presentation on the program, uh, to guide you through the agenda of the event. Um, the first part, uh, we are going to have uh, two presentations, one from Mr. Ben Sanders, uh, an international expert uh, and UNHC consultant on sports for development and peace, that he was tasked to do the analysis as an external of the Line Up Liva program. And uh, uh, also uh, David Eckholm, 
She is a lecturer in the Department of Culture and Society in the University of Lycoming in Sweden. That he has uh, conducted uh, uh, extensive research on, on sports uh, programs in the context of violence and crime prevention. And uh, following these two presentations, we're going to have a, a Q&A session with the two panelists, uh, reflecting also on the comments that you have submitted in the pre-registration forms. And in the second part, we're going to continue with the three uh, additional presentations from implementing partners. And we're going to have speakers from South Africa, Jamaica, and also Loris Foundation, that is a global network and implementing sports programs across the globe. So without uh, further delay, I would like to uh, start by giving a short overview uh, to the Lana Priva program. That will be also an introduction to the main uh, um, presentation from Ben, uh, that he's going to zoom in into the results of the assessment. Um, so, let me see how to change the slides. So, um, so the Crime Prevention for Sports initiative, uh, uh, UNODC works uh, with sports at different levels. Line Up, Live Up uh, is one uh, um, uh, component of our, uh, our, uh, our program. So uh, we are working at the capacity building uh, level, providing developing tools. Uh, Line Up, Live Up is one of these tools. Uh, and also providing uh, training uh, for how sports can be used uh, in an effective way in the context of violence and crime prevention. We also support member states to uh, uh, design and uh, integrate sports-based intervention in this context. Um, part of our activities also focusing on awareness raising and community-based um, interventions that engage in young people, but also local community. Uh, and uh, also we work uh, on, on, on facilitating access to sports uh, through refurbishment of sports facilities, also provision of sports equipment in order to uh, build the capacity uh, at local level to engage young people through sports. So very shortly, uh, as already mentioned, the program started in 2016 with developing the Lana Vibap training curriculum. And through uh, the last years, uh, through the Line Up Live Up program, uh, we have reached out more than 13,000 youth that they participated in the trainings uh, supported by UNODC directly uh, and uh, also trained more than 900 uh, trainers, coaches, uh, community workers and teachers to implement uh, Line Up Live Up program but also broadly use sports in this context. Uh, also, you can see refurbishment work that was carried out uh, in different countries. Uh, and support to sports uh, facilities and community centers through sports equipment. And lastly, we also uh, work with the community uh, and uh, civil society organization through provision of grants to further promote uh, sports-based interventions at uh, local and community level. So the Line Up Live Up, uh, it is uh, a core element of our sports initiative. Uh, so what is the Line Up Live Up? It is for those that you are not so familiar with. Uh, it is a sports-based curriculum. It is evidence-informed. Uh, it, uh, uh, inclu uh, it includes 10 sessions uh, that aim to uh, build the skills and, uh, of young, young people and increase knowledge in related to uh, risk uh, or for, for risk for risk uh, for risk related to violence and crime. So uh, in our work on, with the Line Up Live Up, sport is being used as a tool, as a vehicle uh, to work with young people, uh, mainly through skills development. So we're using as a mediator factor skills, attitudes and knowledge. Uh, and based on this, we have built a theory of change of the program uh, on, that you will see in my other slide. So, we have developed a very solid monitoring and evaluation framework that builds on our theory of change, that foresees short, mid and long term outcomes uh, based on uh, the mediating factors that we uh, already mentioned. Uh, so what we measure is actually the skills development, the changes in the perception, the increase in knowledge, uh, changes in the attitude. And we also designed a solid methodology on measuring impact. Uh, both as part of the regular monitoring and evaluation framework, but also for more in-depth impact and process assessment studies. So very briefly, uh, you can see the different tools that have been developed and used 
this includes youth surveys uh, uh, with the young participants of the program, uh, but also focus group discussion with the youth and the trainers, and uh, uh, also other, uh, other other tools, uh, getting information also on the process uh, and the design of the program, the process of implementation, which we find is very important uh, in order uh, to analyze also the findings of the impact and understand better how we can improve program delivery. So what you hear uh, talking about the Lana Plebap assessment, as already mentioned by Candice and Marco, um, we have a new publication that we looked into the monitoring and evaluation data that we collected the last three years of piloting in 12 countries. Uh, and uh, also, uh, in addition to the regular monitoring evaluation data, we're also analyzing uh, data from two in-depth studies on process and impact assessment that we conducted in South Africa and in Brazil with external evaluators and close partnership with our, our state partners in these two countries. Uh, so here you can see an overview of the type of data that we are going to uh, we have analyzed that includes an impressive number, I think, of uh, 340. 3,490 youth surveys from 11 countries, in addition to focus group discussion, mentoring reports, uh, and other type of data. So without other delay, I would like to pass the floor to Ben Sanders to uh, guide you through the findings of our assessment. So Ben, the floor is yours, so you can guide us through the lineup of assessments and the key findings. Thank you very much, Georgia. Um, and uh, good day to everyone, including His Excellency the Sultan, uh, UNODC staff, um, fellow speakers, and of course, everyone else uh, joining uh, this important event today. Um, it was actually exactly a year ago tomorrow that many of us met to discuss and share experiences on the lineup Live Up program in Vienna. Uh, when we could meet in person, as Candace intimated, and it's really a pleasure now to be able to share some insights, some lessons, and some recommendations uh, from the Line Up Live Up pilot program, um, which UNODC has been managing. Um, so I hope everyone can see my screen fine. Um, a brief overview of youth crime prevention through sports. Um, uh, the use of sport has increasingly been used to prevent not just crime, but also violence and substance abuse among young people, um, including within the criminal justice system to prevent recidivism, reoffending, and promote social integration. Um, it's important to know that sport can be used at both the primary, secondary and tertiary prevention level with different groups and that this requires different approaches and guidance. And it's important to acknowledge that while there's limited evidence of a causal link between sport participation and prevention of crime, research does suggest sport can be used to effectively engage young people. However, we do face a measurement challenge both within the sport and crime prevention and the broader sport and development sector at times. And um, while the use of sport for development and crime prevention has grown significantly, many projects exhibit an ongoing gap between evidence and practice, um, which does make it difficult at times to determine both the efficacy of programs as well as their scalability. And the UN Action Plan on Sport for Development and Peace, um, as well as the Kazan Action Plan, two important global frameworks, have recognized this and seek to improve sport-related data, um, including the need to develop evidence-based arguments for investments in physical education, physical activity of sport, and the development of model indicators to measure the contribution of sport to SDG goals and targets, including SDG 16 um, around crime prevention and peace building. So we need to really understand how change occurs um, through sport and why, rather than assuming a miracle can occur through the use of sport. And this is why it's so important to collect data. Without data, um, we only really hold opinions and beliefs about whether something works and uh, anecdotal evidence is not sufficient for us to understand how and why programs work and if they're able to achieve their outcomes. 
brief overview of the research, and I'm sure David, um, often people talk a little bit more about this. Um, there's been an increase in research um, based on the growing interest in sport and youth crime prevention. Advocates argue that sport can divert youth from DVNC in a number of ways. However, the relationship between sport and crime prevention is complex. There are complexities and risks in using sport. Uh, sport does not automatically lead to positive outcomes, as is commonly assumed. And it's clear that sport can be both a protective factor, but it can also be a risk factor for youth crime prevention and delinquency, meaning it is the way in which sport is organized that is crucial. Sport-based interventions can be organized in ways that promote gender equity. They can also be organized in ways that reinforce harmful gender norms, for example. Okay, we'll move on to the lineup live up assessment, which Georgia has touched on um, briefly. Um, uh, as she mentioned, in this uh, assessment of the pilot period, 855 persons were trained to deliver the program, and a total of almost 13,000 youth participated in the program in the 11 countries you can see uh, in the image on the right. Um, and now we will run through some key findings of this program and their intersection with the broader literature. So this will include the relevance of the program, the fidelity of the program, the quality and effectiveness of the program, the climate within which programs occur, as well as program sustainability. Program relevance um, is obviously critical for programs to be appealing and relevant uh, for both coaches and young people. Um, from the surveys and the research we've done, the Line Up Live Up program was seen as highly relevant. Um, the majority of trainers, 92% of trainers, were extremely satisfied or very satisfied with the training, while the vast majority of youth uh, reported learning new skills and that the training content was appropriate and relevant to their lives. Furthermore, we, see, we saw good rates of participation and motivation with 95% of youth attending over 70% of the 10 session intervention. Uh, furthermore, the impact assessment conducted in South Africa uh, did find an association between the number of sessions attended by participants and gains in knowledge, suggesting that there may be a dosage effect. In other words, the more sessions attended by youth, the more likely they are, they are to gain knowledge and develop certain skills. In terms of program fidelity, quality and effectiveness, um, these are crucial again in influencing outcomes. Um, and from our assessment, we saw that the program achieved short-term outcomes and selected medium-term outcomes. These included self-reported increases in knowledge and skills that enhance protective factors on the one hand and reduce risk factors for young people. And these findings were supported by more rigorous studies in South Africa and Brazil and conducted by external evaluators with a control group or comparison group, as Georgia mentioned, which showed that the program led to youth being supported and motivated, enhanced interaction and relationships, and improved set of personal and pro-social life skills. So the following table um, is based on the perceived change in knowledge and skills among youth participants um, from over 2,400 youth uh, from selected countries. Um, and it shows the percentage of self-reported change um, in certain areas of knowledge and skills, showing that there was a significant self-reported change by young people involved in the program in these various areas of knowledge and skills that are protective factors for building youth resilience to crime, violence, um, and substance abuse. Furthermore, the assessment showed that the provision of training, mentoring and support capacitated the trainers or coaches and allowed them to make incremental improvements throughout the program. However, I think we need to um, acknowledge that further study is merited as there has not been a long term assessment of the intervention during the pilot period, even though selected short term and medium results were achieved. Program climate is another critical factor and that influences uh, the effectiveness of interventions. And research shows that there is a real association between the moral climate of sports and the moral behavior of young athletes. And that is why it is important, as the LULU program does, to create an optimal learning environment, including by capacitating trainers. And um, we saw very positive results with youth indicating that a positive relationship with their trainer. And this is critical because the coach-participant relationship is one of the most important variables 
and influencing outcomes in any sport-based intervention. Finally, program sustainability. Uh, we know this is critical for long-term change and that this can include linkages to national crime prevention frameworks to institutionalized programs. From the beginning, uh, UNODC has worked with state partners to ensure LULU is aligned to national and local policies, plans, and strategies. And in some countries, this has yielded great success. In Kyrgyzstan, the program is incorporated in the training curriculum of the State Sport Academy and introduced into secondary schools as part of the curriculum, while in Peru, it is integrated into a much bigger program called Safe Neighborhoods, and in South Africa, it is part of a large provincial school sport program. I will now cover briefly some lessons learned and recommendations uh, from the LULU assessment, which can help inform future policy and practice on the use of sport for youth crime prevention. And the recommendations are characterized across the following themes, the integration of sport and crime prevention frameworks, recommendations for program design and guidance, training and support, program assessment and analysis, sustainability, and finally communications. And of course, we recognize that all recommendations should be contextualized and adapted if need be. The integration of sport and crime prevention is critical if we wish to mainstream such approaches. It is important to position sport-based approaches within more comprehensive and holistic programs, and especially policies, frameworks, and plans that tackle crime and violence prevention. So recommendations include the need to consider how sport-based approaches can complement, be incorporated into, and even mainstreamed in youth crime and violence prevention policies, while also considering how violence and crime prevention can be embedded within sporting structures. It is important that we address individual, family, and societal risk and protective factors of crime involving parents and communities, as well as youth. The need to prioritize interventions in schools and integrating sport in the education system is critical while still ensuring that out of school youth are reached. We need to continuously measure goals, objectives, and targets, and finally ensure policies and programs are inclusive with no one left behind. Program design is critical and, and must consider non-sport components and promote participation and internal motivation, be flexible and responsive, and consider ways for knowledge and skills to be transferred beyond the intervention. So here we recommend that targeted approaches are developed, considering age, sex, delivery setting. And um, there's a need to integrate and adapt approaches, whether one is using them for primary, secondary, or tertiary prevention, and provide guidance in this regard. Working with local stakeholders is critical for adaptation. And the need to provide follow-up support and continuous engagement is important to sustain results. Program delivery um, is critical and relies on qualified and competent trainers. And the assessment revealed the importance of strengthening training and mentoring support for trainers. Trainers are critical uh, in ensuring that sessions can be delivered with fidelity, quality, and effectiveness. And often not enough attention is, a pay, is paid to capacitating trainers to ensure that interventions are delivered as effectively as possible. So it is recommended to select suitable trainers with selection criteria, customize capacity building activities, strengthen the use of experiential learning and practical activities, explore innovative methods, including the use of technology, particularly relevant at this time during the COVID pandemic, and considering an optimal blend of experience among coaches as well as incentives. Program assessment is critical and we know that we need improved research and monitoring and evaluation to analyze this complex relationship between sport and crime prevention. So recommendations uh, include the need to build the capacity of actors and partners to conduct research in m and There is often a focus on program delivery with limited attention paid to assessment and data collection. The need to adopt the mixed methods approach and triangulate data where possible is recommended while of course adhering to regulations around data quality, verification, storage, ethics, and confidentiality. It is critical to assess both process and impact, to understand not just if change occurred, but if change did occur, how and why did change occur? What were the components and critical factors that caused change, if any, to occur? And finally, there's a need to compare and analyze disaggregated data to assess program efficacy across variables so we can determine where programs work, when programs work, and for whom programs work. 
and recognizing that a targeted approach is needed depending on the setting, the audience, and the outcomes we aim to achieve. The sustainability of programs is crucial for medium and long-term results and contributing to broader policies and plans linked to crime prevention and violence. And we've already seen evidence of the LULU program contributing to national policies, plans, and frameworks. So quickly, the recommendations include the need to ensure continued engagement with and buy-in from state partners and stakeholders to strengthen ownership, leadership, and support, which has been a strength of the LULU program. Support program institutionalization. So their programs are not once off, they are not fly by night, but they are integrated into existing initiatives and prioritizing adaptation of training materials. Noting guidance and ensuring that adaptation does not hinder program fidelity and quality. And finally, it is important to keep raising awareness of sports approaches. Within the sports sector and within sport de for development, many of us are aware of the benefits that sport can play in crime prevention and youth development. However, we need to build a multi-stakeholder approach. We need to speak to people outside of sport, outside of sports and development, in the broader humanitarian and development fields. And when we communicate and raise awareness, we need to do so in simple and clear ways. This includes using positive messaging and mitigating stigma in the use of language when describing programs that seek to address crime prevention or deviancy. Aligning programs to broader platforms, such as the International Day of Sport for Development and Peace, uh, platforms linked to violence and crime prevention and other significant events. And engaging a much broader range of stakeholders who may benefit from sport-based programs in their work. And finally, there's clearly a need to consider appropriate communities of practice to share program experiences at local, national, regional, and global levels. Finally, to conclude, and the assessment in the broader literature stressed the potential of sport for crime prevention. Um, I've gone through the recommendations, which include the need to consider integrating sport-based approaches, the need to intentionally design and deliver programs, to build the capacity of trainers and partners, ensure local ownership, leadership and support, and continue to raise awareness. So it's clear that while sport alone cannot tackle crime prevention, that intentional sport-based approaches can be optimized to play a greater role in youth crime prevention. I'd just like to thank everyone who contributed to this research, including Georgia, Lucia, and all the other UNODC staff. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. It was quite comprehensive. Allow me to focus uh, and underline something that I think is very important to, to point is the role of trainers and how also lineup live up assessment is something that comes from other research, but somehow the lineup live up assessment also, you know, reiterate reinforce uh, something that we knew already the role of trainers, uh, it is uh, crucial. Uh, uh, and uh, in uh, having a, a impactful and effective interventions and certainly something that uh, we should invest uh, uh, um, if we want to you know improve quality and impact of sports based interventions and I mentioned also the trainers um, because uh, David in uh, his presentation I think is also going to touch upon the role of trainers um, uh, explaining us uh, better on how and why sports-based interventions can be uh, very effective in the context of violence and crime prevention. Um, so I will, uh, you can leave us for the moment and I can call you later after David's intervention for a short Q&A session. So David, please. Uh, thank you. Um... Uh, and first of all, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak at this important event. As a researcher, it's fundamental to engage in dialogue uh, with uh, practitioners and policymakers. And in my presentation now, I will, I will touch up on uh, some subjects that already Candice uh, Welsh mentioned and uh, Georgia Dimitriopoulou and Ben Sanders, of course, uh, concerned in their presentations. So there might be a bit of repetition here, but uh, we're into the same topics, uh, of course. I shall try and get my presentation. So, 
So the the uh, utility of sport for peace and development, as well as crime and drug prevention, have been raised as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Sport activities are conceived of as a tool for a variety of social objectives, targeting a variety of social mechanisms affecting the lives of particularly young people. Sport certainly has the potential to benefit crime and drug prevention ambitions, but we must note that we are talking about the potential utility of sport. And accordingly, we must reflect upon how this potential can be realized. And in order to approach such, such issues, we must note that there are diverse forms of interventions and objectives of crime prevention. Crime prevention is not one singular thing. So crime prevention interventions uh, are sometimes divided between primary, secondary and tertiary levels and objectives. And in my empirical research conducted in, in a Swedish context or Northern European context, I've studied interventions on the primary and secondary level of prevention. Uh, however, the important thing here uh, between the different levels of prevention is to note that there are different concepts of prevention and the conditions for interventions and the success expected from them are generally quite different. So still there are also conceptual overlaps between the different forms that I will address uh, shortly. Uh, if we look broadly into the scientific discourse and research literature, much have been written and presented about evidence-based uh, effective practices in the use of sport. And in addition, a variety of programs are developed based on various theories of change. And there seems to be increasing communication between the scientific perspectives and the professional development of sports-based interventions on different levels and in different contexts. And the line up and live up uh, intervention presented before provides some really good examples of, of this. Um, so so um, I will not speak uh, precisely about this uh, line up and, and live up report, but, but uh, generally in, in when it comes to sports-based interventions, there are some recurring concerns or perhaps even blind spots that that uh, needs to be addressed when it comes to the design of sports-based interventions. And I will address in this presentation three questions of what we can view as transfers. So first, it's the transfer of life skills from sport to other spheres of society. And second, the transfer of conduct or skills from transferred from coaches, leaders, staff to participant young people. And third, the transfer of sports-based interventions from one site and context to another. So first, we have the transfer of life skills. Sport-based interventions most often are underpinned by notions and ambitions of individual and social development. This means that participant subjects can learn and acquire skills that can be utilized in wider context than that of sport. It is important that the transfer is expected as strategically planned rather than taken for granted. The transfers do not come automatically. So here, here a distinction can be made in the scientific discourse between explicit and implicit transfers. So first there's a notion about explicit transfers that refer to the transfer of skills that are pronounced and subject to conscious reflection. So in the programs you discuss what kind of transfers can you acquire within the sport context uh, and how can they be used outside of the sport context. And also we have the notion about implicit transfer that tar targets the implicit development of cognitive, emotional or social skills in sport activities, focusing on how such skills include abstract dimensions that make it possible for skills such as problem so solving, decision making and emotional self-esteem to be adapted and used in other settings, but you don't need to make them explicit. So when relying on practices to facilitate development of life skills, managers and organizers need to have a clear idea of how to foster such skills and what kind of skills needs uh, to be developed. Because the development of skills is a strategic and pedagogical potential, it's not a pre-given outcome of sport participation. And also we have the transfer of conduct or skills between co coaches and young people. And in sports-based interventions, coaches and staff have important roles to play for the development and social change of young people, often in the capacities of role models attributed to them. However, we must interrogate and reflect upon the delivery of skills 
and models of conduct provided by leaders and coaches. It is not an automatic transfer of skills of conduct from the coaches to the participants. For instance, <clears throat> it has been noted that sports-based interventions sometimes fail to provide pedagogical activities when coaches themselves do not consider themselves as conductors of education, but rather as providers of sport activities. Likewise, when attributed the position as a role model embodying and prescribing the conduct desired, coaches themselves must be aware that this is a strategic pedagogical element of the activities. To model the conduct of the participant youth is not per definition a technology which is desired with a desired and particular outcome. It can vary. Obviously, the outcome depends on the education or character of conduct provided. Therefore, staff education is vital for the delivery and success of sports-based interventions. And also we have the transfer of interventions from one cont context to another. Sports-based interventions developed on a specific site and in a specific context often provides a model that can be evaluated and even evidence-based. And such models are sometimes constructed for implementation on other sites and other, in, in other contexts. That is what is meant by a transfer of an intervention model. However, such transfers come with a range of challenges concerning primarily what aspects of the interventions that can be transferred and implemented in other settings and which aspects of the interventions that need to be redeveloped in the new setting. Interventions most often do not simply transfer and replicate from one setting to another. And accordingly, certain elements of interventions need also to develop locally. There needs to be made a distinction between implementation and development or implementing and developing different parts of interventions. So for instance, uh, one way to, to approach this is by distinguishing between um, different aspects of a particular intervention we can distinguish between practice and program. Practice can be understood as the setup of rules, organization of play, the organization of on-site coaches and leaders, and the educational arrangement imbued in practices. Whereas program infrastructures can be viewed as the design for establishing sustained operation, the management and recruitment of coaches, financial administration, strategies of cooperation and communication with stakeholders and other involved partners and strategies for funding from supporters and capacities to apply for funding and such. So here practices can oftentimes be easily transferred, diffused or implemented in new contexts. Programs though or program infrastructures cannot be easily diffused and implemented in new settings. So therefore designing interventions on the level of the program must be locally developed rather than implemented. So in this, in this uh, altogether this um, concerns some, uh, some things. The point being that none of them, none of the forms of transfers described comes spontaneous naturally or by default, yeah, just because it's sport activities or, or such. There are potentials that need to be strategically planned for the potential to be fulfilled. Notably, transfers are a key to the development and success of sports-based interventions, and therefore must be reflected upon carefully. The concerns raised can be addressed and integrated in models of sports-based interventions that are informed and underpinned by uh, precisely elaborated theories of change. But I, I would like to alert another thing, perhaps, that though the concerns of transfers uh, described are often characterized by local variations, they are uh, context specific. So therefore, the general competences of organizers, managers and coaches are important, are important in order to fulfill the potential of sports based interventions, rather than unilaterally focusing on established evidence based models that could be transferred, replicated and implemented. I believe that we need to pay more attention to the importance of training and education for leaders and organizers to attain competences to develop sports-based interventions in different and diverse ways based on the local conditions with a focus on the young people for whom these efforts are provided. So in conclusion, 
Transfers are difficult, but a key to realize the potential of sports-based interventions. They need to be strategically planned in order to control the potential outcomes. For planning and development with respect to the local context, the competences of organizers, managers, and coaches are really important. So I have a, this presentation is based on some uh, particular uh, research studies uh, they are in in uh, in this presentation and, and uh, could be attained if anyone wants to look closer into the suggested reading but um, thank you so thank you David you can uh, stop sharing if you would yes. like thank you um, it was a uh, very interesting presentation, I have to say, and you, you managed to address uh, uh, some of the questions also that participants has raised. Uh, so coming back to your presentation, first of all, I would like also to ask Ben to join us for a short Q&A uh, session uh, reflecting on the questions from the participants. I would like to ask you uh, to very briefly, very short, uh, say, uh, what are the three, let's say, major elements, major points, uh, or major conditions for sports-based interventions to to be effective in violence and crime prevention? Because all speakers so far, from Candice, Ben, you, myself, we uh, stress that uh, the relation of sports with the violence and crime prevention is not a causal relationship, and there are, sports can be effective, you know, but in a, uh, in a certain condition. So. If you can just summarize these three key points that comes uh, to your mind, what will be the trainers, the capacity? I mean, so Ben? Yeah, thanks, Georgia. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, a few tips, I think, building the capacity of trainers and ensuring there's regular support and monitoring for coaches and trainers so that they um, are able to effectively appropriate concepts um, and deliver interventions with fidelity to young people, recognizing that trainers themselves are beneficiaries too. So I think that's num number one. I think the intentional design of programs, so building clear theories of change linked to your outcomes, being realistic about what you want to achieve within, within your program design, um, and uh, targeted guidance based on this. And then thirdly, um, I would just say linking this to your measurement framework. So ensuring that your program design um, and what you measure are linked um, and that you are realistic um, and relevant about what you measure um, related to your original outcomes. Um, and finally, just the flexibility to adapt and be responsive to, to local and community needs that may emerge. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ben. David, anything to add? Um, yeah, perhaps, but but I must say that uh, my response would be uh, more or less more or less the same as as uh, Ben Sanders' response. Yeah. But like the first of all is 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 what he said: a clear rationality of the theory of change. You must sort of know what you're doing and and why you're doing the things that you're doing. What are the means yeah, and what are the ends of of the intervention. If you don't have a clear rationality or, or a theory of, of, of the change expected, then uh, yeah, well, then you can do more or less anything. Um, and also, yeah, I think uh, Ben started to talk about the realist, realist uh, expectations. We all know that, that there are a range of things influencing um, young people's yeah, delinquency and, and um, experiences in crime and drugs and social problems broadly, social exclusion. And we cannot expect uh, sport or sports-based interventions uh, so little to, to address all these very complex uh, questions. And that, that concerns also um, how we can design interventions in different countries and in different social contexts when when the challenges faced and the understandings of crime and the, the understandings of delinquency varies a great deal. So that's what I mean with the contextualization between um, intervention designs, but also with the expected outcomes and, and benefits from participation. 
uh, thanks. That leads me to another question that uh, many participants are asking, and I think has a great interest because indeed adaptation, contextualization, however we call it, is is very important. But in the context of evidence-based programs, uh, where they are based on a very solid theory of change, as you said, that it is a requirement to be effective. To what extent we can adapt, or what are the elements uh, that we can adapt when we are transfer, for example, a practice from one context to a different context, and what are the things that we shouldn't, let's say, touch? They should remain. Um, so, Ben. Yeah, thanks. I think it's it's a great it's a great question. I mean, it, it really is a balancing act, um, but I think it's clear as demonstrated by the Lulu program and assessment, but in many other programs, adaptation is critical, and that includes, I think, translation often in local and national contexts, um, and cultural adaptation. So a good example from the Lulu program was issues related to alcohol and substance abuse are taboo in some countries and, and you know, can't necessarily be addressed in the same way. Um, at the same time, um, one does need to ensure fidelity. So I think if one is adapting or translating content and various parts of content and materials uh, to be more culturally appropriate, that is that is fine, and that not need not necessarily impact the broader, you know, theory of change, um, in 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 various ways or the sort of components or underlying principles of an intervention, such as the need to sh ensure well-trained and qualified coaches, um. So I think that there is a tricky balance, but I think that um, you know adaptations can certainly be made at a sort of a cosmetic level, at a language level, um, even at a training um, at level. But sort of the overall program design may um, may be kept relatively intact um, as far as possible. I'll leave it there. David, from your yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great question, and it's also um, a question that illustrates the complexity. Because, uh, of course, if you have a um, successful program or a model, there are of course certain forms of infrastructure that can be utilized in different contexts, and you need to to have uh, some sort of fidelity towards that because uh, they work and they function. But I'm but I I must stress that that these are the abstract infrastructures that need to be paid. Um, some some fidelity too. Um, I I think also that in in the presentation of the Lulu report, there were some good examples about how to integrate the ideas of of uh, the sports based interventions into the local settings of regular crime prevention programs, for instance, in South Africa mm -hmm. and in other places. And I think that's a good uh, good example for. Of, of how to um, sort of adapt to the local context be because we need to use also the infrastructures that already are in place and already are successful even though they aren't precisely um, working with, with with sports and with sport federations and sport clubs and such so, so infrastructures are often out there in in, in the welfare uh, societies or in developing societies use them so a, a last question uh, is about the measurement of impact um, and um, just we talk a lot about skills development and learning how we measure these type of outcomes through sport uh, based intervention but uh, there are a lot of questions of, of what else what are the other type of outcomes uh, in addition to skills and learning outcomes for young people that are relevant to violence and crime prevention we can be achieved through sports programs and can be measured also um so from your research and experience what else uh what type to what other outcomes could be achieved through sports that are measurable also yeah may if i start uh, yeah. mainly uh mainly with, within the scientific literature there there are um, um outcomes of diversion or physical diversion of course it doesn't really require the pedagogical elements perhaps or, or theories of change and, and uh, operates primarily on, on uh, sort of the tertiary and secondary level uh, but even on, on primary level perhaps um, meaning that sort of when, when young people uh, are 
occupied or diverted away from sort of risk contexts uh, and doing sport activities, which they believe is fun and, and meaning making, um, then they're diverted from contexts of risk. And that's, uh, I think, yeah, that's a, a good potential. Ben? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I agree with what David said. Um, I think, um, uh, I think, well, I think when we think about impact, we need to be realistic. First of all, as I said, if you run in a short term or limited intervention, just, you know, it, it, it may be unlikely to yield long term impact. So identify appropriate outputs or outcomes. And I'd also say measure both process and impact. So we know how and why change occurred. And um, in terms of concrete outcomes, um, in addition to the sort of diversion that David uh, mentioned, I think also this idea that it can create social capital. So, you know, engaging in these programs can uh, result in enhanced interaction and relationships, both with between youth, between youth and coaches who may be the a trusted adult in their life. That's why that relationship is so important. There's a sense often of positive peer pressure, which may increase resilience to crime and deviancy. And we've also seen that sport can play a role in increasing, for example, employability um, and leadership skills among young people, which are, which are protective factors actually both for participants and for coaches. Um, in this uh, in this space, uh, so I'll leave it there for now. But thanks again for the time, and happy to to take any other questions. Uh, th thank you, Ben. I think the speakers later they um, uh, they're gonna say some more about you know uh, practices and good practice examples, and point out to different uh, uh, to the use of sports in a different context, also at the community level, and build also community resilience, safe space approach. So we will hear more about it. Very last question and very short answer. There is, you are familiar with the dilemma on qualitative, quantitative data, you know, how we really prove impact. Um, is this a real dilemma? And when it comes to measuring uh, uh, sports-based outcomes, uh, then what type of data uh, we should look for in order to, to justify uh, positive results? and say that, yes, it works. Yeah, yeah, if I start. But it's not an answer, I know, but if you can make it short. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to do it really short. Yeah, but we need, of course, uh, all kind of data or experiences, empirical data, qualitative and quantitative. Yeah, I, I think uh, if I just mention short, yeah, I think we, we must not overestimate the value of uh, quantitative data that we are not quite sure all the time about what they actually mean. So, so the sort of evidence uh, discourse or standardization discourse might uh, sometimes even divert from sort of the creativity and development of, of um, um, interventions. But yeah, I can go in deeper in that sometime. Uh, yeah, just qu quickly in um, one minute. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think we, ideally mixed methods is important. I, I mean, I think the sport for development sector has been hamstrung sometimes by having too much anecdotal data, it's sort of too much nice stories. Um, and we need to combine that with some sort of hard quantitative evidence, but we still n need case studies, observations and qualitative data. So ideally, if we can triangulate data, it will increase the data quality you know, validity, reliability. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean that every research study needs to be a, a sort of randomized control trial. That's not possible. But, you know, you can use some simple methods, surveys and interviews to combine quantitative and qualitative methods, um, which can be used by most organizations. So thank you both. I think it was a very informative session. Hope you will stay for, with us for the next session. Um, so before moving to the next session, I would like to use the time to show you um, a, a short video uh, that's uh, also as an illustration of the different type of work that we do as we know this year under the Crime Prevention Through Sports Initiative. This is a video that was developed recently in uh, Uzbekistan and it's uh, formed part of a national uh, awareness raising campaign that uh, we develop in a partnership with Ministry of Sports, Ministry of Education uh, and other uh, uh, state partners. 
uh, also the National Olympic Committee. Uh, and this is, I think, another way to see how sports um, uh, can be used in the context of violence and crime prevention. Uh, uh, an example of how we can use uh, athletes as role models in order to communicate positive messages to young people. And without the delay. So that was a small sample. So let's move now to the second session. And the first session we heard from Ben and David uh, um, from a research perspective, uh, how sports can be used. We talk about uh, impact assessments uh, and studies. And now in this session, we have three, um, three speakers that are gonna give us um, an insight of uh, more practical examples of how sports are used at uh, a national context and uh, been integrated in uh, uh, local or national policies. So I would like to uh, ask first um, Mr. Hilton Stroud uh, from Department of Cultural Affairs and Sports in Western Cape Government in South Africa uh, to take the floor in order to guide us through uh, Western Cape uh, local uh, uh, policy uh, and uh, explain us how sports um, I've been using this context uh, to address uh, uh, youth violence, but also community violence. So, Hilton, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Georgia. Um, good afternoon, all. Firstly, on behalf of the Western Cape Government, Department of Culture, Affairs and Sport, I'd like to thank the UNODC for the opportunity to present the work we have implemented using sport as a tool for drug and crime prevention. It is well documented that South Africa has a serious problem with substance abuse and violence, specifically violence by youth and against youth. There are huge numbers of occurrences of violence daily, and usually the victims are youth and women. It has become so bad that the president has called our, it our, sec our second pandemic. We are living in one of the scariest times, especially if you are a woman. These times points me to a phrase that was used in the past when our country was fighting for non-racial sport. The phrase was non normal, no normal sport within abnormal society. The scourge of violence and substance abuse has created an, an abnormal society and sport cannot operate if the status quo is the same. Sport has a big role to address, to address these issues and you will hear today. Sport is not the silver bullet. In many ways, sport plays a part in enabling Hilton, uh, we cannot see your uh, PowerPoint presentation, so. Okay, hold on. I was going to open it now, but it's open now. Uh, there we go. Okay. Can everyone see it? Yes, we see it now. Okay, cool. So um, sport is, uh, as I said, sport is not a silver bullet. And in many ways, sport plays a part in enabling what is currently happening. But you may but want to move the slides to the one. Because yeah, this introduction, Georgia, uh, before I get into the, the content. So, but we as organizations involved in sport need to use sport as a tool for behavioral change, whilst acknowledging that we might too be adding to the problem. We need to adapt our programs accordingly. Today, 
South Africa has great policies to address violence, crime, and substance abuse guided by its constitution. And within the national, within its national development plan, youth development act, and youth policy, and various white papers on safety and security and sport, it is in our implementation where we sometimes fall short. Provincially, there are prioritized areas which all departments should focus on. These are called VIPs, vision-inspired priorities. As you can see, the main one is safe and cohesive communities, growth and jobs, empowering people, and with mobility, spatial transformation, innovation, and culture. Um, as you can see, under safe and cohesive communities, reducing violence by and against youth and children is one of the major focus areas, including social cohesion and safer public spaces. As a department, we, our contribution to achieving uh, safe and cohesive communities, we play a huge role in, in engaging in after-school programs, which has a particular focus on reducing the risks of absenteeism and antisocial behavior through active sports and arts clubs and connections to positive peer groupings, uh, reducing the risk of marginalization by creating opportunities for marginalized youth to be part of programming, the risk of violence by providing opportunities to to, for building young people's skills in alternative ways of engaging and dealing with conflict and anger, and also utilization of schools as safe places for communities after school hours. And our department safety priority is to engage youth at risk in sports, arts, and culture programs. With regards to our programs that we run, to play our part of the department within the department and within sport development directorate the concept of neighbor development through sports arts and culture utilizes the school and its community as a base for of its efforts to provide safe places cohesive communities empowering people and community growth and jobs schools are found in all communities and provide physical resources that are readily available and and with our target audience already involved in various academic programs we see our part in the holistic development of youth by providing programming that stimulates creativity through creation, sport, arts, culture during after school hours. Today I'll be focused on three areas uh, we have been able to make the most impact, the one being provision of a participant pipeline. We have, see, we have seen that there has to be an opportunity for mastery within our program, not just within sports skills, but also with life skills, with regards to leadership and being spoke about earlier on, obviously other avenues where they can express those skills that they have learned. So within the participant pipeline, we can see that with the, school, with the learners attending first early childhood development centers, which is ages three to five, and also primary school, secondary school, and also tertiary institutions. At each center, they have access to participate within a club within the neighborhood, and through the club, they can participate within leagues and federations and high performance, which we won't focus on today. But there is a, a pathway also, if they participate in our programs, to either tertiary institutions, universities, or to the workplace. And that becomes vital, um, showing a pathway and also access to mastery. The second path area I will speak about is club creation. Club support given to communities to create sports, arts, and culture clubs are vital to provide youth with an, with an alternative, in our case, specific to gangs, and provide them with a sense of identity and belonging. It's important that these positive social groups come from and consist of members of their own community. It, provi it provides individuals with positive role models from the community and a way to share experiences with people who experience the same issues as them. As you can see in the diagram, within the, the neighborhood schools, primary and high, with the ECD centers, the club would consist of learners, coaches, teachers, and community members. And with, within the club, they, we promote two approaches, one being recreational and one professional. Obviously, recreational being practiced for well-being, for fun, belong to socialize, develop the community, and then on the profi professional approach, we obviously play to win, display of talent, team focus, and a business-based model and building self-esteem. The third area to focus on is the provision of facilities. The provision of world club facilities for the use of the, of the school communities, as mentioned above. This is vital to provide a safe place for programming to take place. The quality of facilities also instills a sense of pride and identity for community members. The confidence individuals receive when practicing and competing on these facilities is important for the growth of the person in sport and in life. The concept of shared facilities also helps with social cohesion where facilities shared by a total of 24 schools 
you can interact with each other on so-called neutral ground, where, level, where the levels of socioeconomic and cultural fields are, e are equal. These facilities are run and sustained with the support of the department, but is run ultimately by the, by the schools and the, and the surrounding communities. To speak about collaborations within this neighborhood development approach, utilizing sport, arts and culture, it's with, the, with our provincial education department, schools management teams, federations, providing um, next level activities, um, provincial social development department, which assists with psychosocial support at these schools, local governments, municipalities with regards to facilities, and then also community safety and police at the local level with regards to uh, police um, awareness and visibility. Upcoming important um, collaborations that we are taking on, we could not do it in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we're still pushing forward to implement as soon as we can. Upcoming would be collaborations with technical and vocational colleges. This is important to provide, as I said, pathways for participants where post-school or even during school, they can explore avenues within training with regards to technical and vocational skills and also where they can express the life lessons that they obtain during the programs through other avenues besides sport. Another one is with universities, which is vital as Ben and David were discussing with regards to research and impact assessments. We are dealing with the University of the Western Cape, who will uh, to be two-folded. One would be through research and one would be through the students um, providing their skills at the obtain University at our centers. Second collaboration is with web-based training institutions, providing our coaches the training and support through various web-based applications. Smart cities, which we're dealing with the Commonwealth, where we're trying to make all our shared facilities at least with infrastructure for so it can be technology appropriate for the type of interventions that youth are using now. Then also NGOs focus on career pathways and support, which is a Two Oceans Academy, where we are providing in individuals with support during school with academic support. And also once they are, uh, they move on to tertiary institutions or technical and vocational colleges that they get the support necessary so that they can complete those studies. Just some experience that we achieved while um, implementing this approach across the last five years. One is that, that the athlete becomes a role model and is central to the community development, funds, benefits, more re recipients, resources, benefits, more re recipients. There's more community involvement. Learner grows up in a real environment. Athletes stay involved in sport. Club creation and further development opportunities are available. Community supports athletes and the clubs because it's situ situated within their community. Learner develops an identity and a sense of belonging. Learners become proud of the area and of the school. And this assists with neighbor development. Access to more coaches who belong to the club and who are in the community. Club, community and family based support systems that are the end to the athletes. And development of squad and squad training and access to shared facilities. Some internal and external observations from 2016 to 2019 as it's the, Safe spaces and cohesive neighborhoods. Currently, 340 schools are supported to be a safe place for school going youth after school hours, and 12 neighborhoods are supported for cohesiveness. Also, addressing unemployment and joblessness, 894 work opportunities were created, and training and development was provided to them. 30% of the work opportunities provided to individuals were to those who have not worked for at least five years. Also, 578 households were supported through the employment the program gave. Addressing high dropout rates and inadequate skills development, unique employment and skills development opportunities to members of the community who have who have not matriculated and therefore is contributing solution. Addressing poor health, HIV, AIDS, prevalence, and high rates of violence and substance abuse. Um, one observation was that 56% of, of a sample interview indicated that they gave better due to participation in sport. 63% of participants reported that the discipline has improved. And also addressing lack of access to sporting and cultural opportunities. 80% of participants reported that their confidence levels have improved. 22,637 new learners joined the program and 998,532 registered individuals for the participants for the program. Addressing the lack of club creation within communities and transformation within sport and recreation professionals. Uh, during 2019, 47 new clubs were established across the province, which added to the total from over the last five years, which is, un is 110. 13,000, more than 13,000 registered participants of, 
of, the, of our program, belong to a club within the community. We've also assisted with the support and formation of club structures, ensuring the community development through the school and club network. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hilton. You can stop sharing. Uh, I think it was just to mention for those that uh, are not uh, aware of that um, Line Up Live Up program was implemented also in South Africa in Western Cape uh, in partnership with the uh, Department of Culture and Sports. Uh, actually, it was implemented as part of the after school pro uh, program um, uh, called MODE. And um, take the opportunity to thank uh, uh, the Western Cape Department and DICAS for our partnership and our contribution uh, in making the impact assessment. Uh, I think uh, that was a success to make it happen, and we couldn't have done it without their support. Sir. Um, going to your presentation, I think it was a very um, concrete example of how uh, sports can be used, uh, can be integrated in the context of local policies for violence and crime prevention and looking also beyond the skills development into how uh, sports are used for neighborhood and community engagement. Um, and we will come back to this um, uh, after uh, in the Q&A session after the other presentation. So thank you for the moment, Hilton. Um, just before moving to the next speaker, I just want to apologize for those that may have some technical issues in the connection, but um, yeah, the participation exceeded our expectation, I have to say, and this might have somehow overload the system, but I think it's stable now. So I would like to uh, ask now uh, Ms. Kelly Magnus to, to join us for her presentation. Kelly is a country lead uh, uh, of Fight for Peace organization in Jamaica. Um, Fight for Peace is a, is a global uh, um, network, is active in many countries, including in Jamaica. Uh, and they have a long uh, standing experience, I think, in using sports in the context of violence and crime prevention. So we're looking forward for your presentation, Kelly, to guide us through um, uh, uh, the situation in Jamaica and how Fight for Peace, in partnership with the state actors, uh, using sports for violence and crime prevention. So, floor is yours. We cannot listen you. Kelly, we cannot hear you. Kelly? Would you, we could move on to the next speaker and then come back to you if there is a technical issue. Maybe first you can try to unmute your microphone, please, Kelly. Okay, for not losing time, since we're going very well in uh, keeping the time in this event, uh, until we resolve the issue with Kelly. Kelly, you are back. We, we cannot hear you. Okay, so um, Martin, I would suggest to move on to our next speaker until we resolve the issue with Kelly. So um, I would like then to ask for another a uh, great partner. I think it's a global network that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's Lores Sports for Good Foundation. Uh, it's a global network supporting various sports-based interventions across the globe, uh, including on aiming at violence and crime prevention. And uh, uh, Dr. Martin Smith, uh, he's a global director of program and grants. He's going to give us an overview of the work of Loris Foundation, looking also on the impact uh, assessment studies and how they measure impact of this intervention. So Martin, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Georgia. And thank you very much for the invitation to, um, to participate in this very exciting meeting. Great presentations great conversations uh, and I'm very proud to have been invited to, to take part in, in, the, in the session. Let me see if I can share my screen. I think you should be able to see the screen now. Um, I will talk very, very briefly about Laureus and then jump straight into just 
I think, three key messages that I would love for all of you to, to take with you from this session. And Kelly, I promise I will not spend too much time. Uh, so there'll still be ample opportunity to share all the exciting work that, that Fight for Peace is doing in Jamaica. Fight for Peace is coincidentally one of our long-term strategic partners in Laurier Sport for Good. Uh, I think we have been collaborating for at least 10 years. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Only three key messages. Uh, there won't be a whole lot of details. Uh, so if anyone is interested in learning more about those key messages, feel free to find me in LinkedIn, write to me in the email, which you can see on the screen right now at the bottom, or find me on Twitter with the handle at mosh65. Very happy to engage in conversations afterwards. Uh, very briefly about Laureus. Uh, many of you will know us already. Some of you may not have heard of us. Some of you might think of the Laureus World Sports Awards or think of us as the Laureus World Sports Academy. Uh, that's also Laureus. I'm from the foundation side of things, which is the, the third pillar of Laureus. We were all born uh, 21 years ago at the uh, inaugural Laureus, Laureus World Sports Awards in the year 2000. Uh, and we were all born in the, under the auspice of the speech of Nelson Mandela. Uh, who provided us the ethos for everything that we're doing uh, based on the statement sport has the power to change the world many of you will know the speech that he held uh, at those world sports awards and it's all about the use of sport to address social issues social change that's laureus uh, laureus sport for good foundation that i'm representing in this meeting we use the power of sport to end violence discrimination and disadvantage very important, the, the last three things, discrimination, violence, and disadvantage. We are all about social change, and we are all about harnessing and using the power of sports to generate social change. We have three mission work streams. One is to support and implement sport for development programs, which we do through grant making and through technical assistance, uh, organization capacity building to, to partner organizations. We also work to strengthen the sport for development community across the world. We do that through uh, developing some of these indicator frameworks that Ben and David spoke of earlier. Um, we actively participate in, in, in many collaborations to develop global standards for how to measure the impact of sport for development. Uh, we have converted that into our own key performance indicator framework that we are using across all of the programs that we support. We also provide learning communities uh, within certain social thematic areas. Uh, we host global uh, summits, both in person and over the past year. Not global summits, but smaller online summits uh, as well. Not letting a pandemic holding us back uh, in what we, what we aspire to achieve. And based on those two, th two things, we do advocacy and influencing work, uh, hoping to unlock more resources for the sport for development community. Currently, we support more than 200 programs, well over 200 programs, in more than four con 40 countries across six continents. We work within the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, our contributions aim to, to, to contribute to achieving uh, advances on all of these 17 different areas by 2030. Uh, specifically, we focus on health and mental well-being, on education, on women and girls, where in particular we address uh, women and girls empowerment and fighting violence against women and girls. We also have a gender equality uh, cross-cutting policy that, that penetrates all activities that we are supporting. Uh, employability, inclusive society, and peaceful society are the, the last three that we are supporting. Crime and violence cut a little bit across all of them. Uh, violence, we have specific targets under peaceful society, whereas crime reduction, uh, tend to be intervention that, that cut across more of these social focus areas, as we call them. Now, for this session, I will really only make one very concrete reference, which is to a program that we have been delivering in the Netherlands over the past, I don't know how many years, but, but uh, several years, we've been working together with the Ministry of Justice in Netherlands. 
implementing a program which aims to reduce or prevent violence and crimes for uh, young people in the age bracket 12 to 18 years old. It's a one year long program. It is delivered in collaboration with sports clubs and with schools and with social services. Uh, it contains a whole range of different interventions uh, meant to support these young people. And after that one year, there is a way of supporting them to transition into to other types of, of activities to, to, to keep momentum going, so to speak, in terms of what they have achieved throughout that, uh, that year of collaboration. Uh, we, of course, do all the indicator monitoring. We are looking at all the different individual changes that are happening, happening in the lives of these young people. So we are looking at many of the things that, that you have already heard about uh, earlier today, such as life skills, social skills, resilience, etc. cetera. Um, but for the purpose of this short presentation, uh, I'll just stick to or focus on one single thing, which is something that we very often don't really look at. Uh, but which is something that policymakers and budget planners and budget decision makers, which I'm sure many of you listening in, uh, belong to that group. Um, what's the value of this? Is it really worth it throwing that much money into doing sport for development programs? David already mentioned once, sport is not the solution to everything. Um, there are many other types of interventions that could probably also achieve similar kind of results. So what is, what, what is it with sport that makes it particularly interesting? And as a budget planner and a policy maker, you need to turn over every single dime you're sitting with, every single euro you're sitting with. You need to invest in the most efficient uh, types of interventions. So what we did in the Netherlands, uh, and we have done that beforehand in another piece of research a few years earlier. But a couple of years ago, we engaged uh, with an auditing firm to make us a cost benefit anal analysis. So in the one end, how much do we put into the program? And in the other end, how much does the society get out of the program? And in terms of our investments, uh, the cost of taking 1000 young people through the program uh, was estimated to be 1,336,000,000 million euros. So an average of about 1,336 euros per, per, per participant in the program, which is a lot of money, but you will probably also, all of you who are involved in program implementation, you will appreciate that some of the people that this type of program are addressing uh, may need a bit more support in delivering the program. It's not any 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 uh, random coach who can deliver the type of activities that 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 corresponds to the kind of achievements that we want to get out of these programs. So there's training that needs to go into it of, of the staff. It might require more staff to deliver the program as well. So it's a bit expensive. One million three hundred and thirty-six million euros to uh, to influence the lives of a thousand young people. Now, what does the society get out of it? And this was was quite a shock for us, uh, but all in a positive sense. The social return on investment seen through the lens of the auditing firm, nationally accredited, it, it, it's all bona fide, so to speak. The return, according to their estimate, ranges between 23 million and 43 million euros for a bit more than 1 million euro investment in this type of program. Uh, quite substantial, and it's much more than uh, what we have been, been, been able to identify beforehand in our, in our previous research. Previously, we mostly looked to, towards the justice chain. Uh, that's, that's a fairly easy one. If you can keep a young person out of prison, it's fairly easy to go through all the calculations of how much it will cost uh, to, to, to investigate, to sentence, uh, to prosecute, to trial, to, to execute the, the sentence and subsequently to support uh, that young person. Uh, this is about five million, a bit more than five million of the overall 23 to 43 million come from, from the justice chain. And this corresponds with quite well with what we have researched before. 
in an uh, international study we did a few years before this one, uh, coming out at about 5 million per 1 million investors. Uh, in this particular piece, the auditors also looked at the young people, the cost associated for the young people, for their own lives, for, for everything that, that lies before them, missed income, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, some of the things can be monitor, monetized uh, and some of the things can only be indicated, uh, which they have also made quite clear in this study. So we're looking at less delinquent behavior, better school performance, typically leading also to better opportunities, more pro-social behavior, also uh, reducing the cost for, for, for themselves individually, and developing more norms and values, which was one of the issues raised earlier by one of the, one of the previous presentations. And then of course, better health uh, reduces the cost for, our, for ourselves individually uh, linked to, to whatever lifestyle we have. But the big one is the cost for society. Uh, one, there is a nuisance factor, which cannot easily be monetized, but you can certainly indicate a plus or a minus link to it. So uh, having less crime, less violence in the society results in less nuisance. It results in, in, in uh, more secure income for both private persons and companies who otherwise would, would be affected through damage, et cetera. And then, uh, let's not forget that uh, young people also look towards their peers for behavior. So if you, in a, in a group of young people, begin to, 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 to show other values, other behavior, you're likely going to see less delinquent behavior in that, that same peer group. So quite substantial uh, cost benefit. And that was my, my first message uh, that I want you to take away from this. And there are a few studies out there that, that further substantiate it, but it's not typically something that we're looking into, but it is something that policymakers and budget planners need to look into uh, when they're sitting with, with scarce resources and have to decide one intervention over another. Now, when we're looking at the type of organizations we're working with, we typically group them in, into three different groups. One, we have the first generation support for development programs that are often based on assumptions about effects. It's mostly about deliver sports uh, for the sake of delivering sports uh, and then wrapping them in a discourse about the positive effects on the people participating in sports. Uh, we have a second generation of programs and these are really exciting because this is where innovation in sport for development typically take place. These are the programs that don't really care about the rules of sport. They might find one sport, uh, but they throw the rule book in the air and they adapt whatever comes down to the social change they want to achieve. Uh, that can be one of the programs we support in, in another space is a netball program in the UK where the entire rule set around that ball has been adapted to deliver certain messages around social media and the behavior of adolescent girls in social media to avoid being bullied, to avoid uh, making themselves vulnerable. So you can fiddle with the rules of sport. You don't need to stick to the rule book or you can combine different types of sports to achieve different kinds of, of uh, results within, within the wider delivery of the program. And then you have the third generation of programs, which typically are the most efficient ones. And the one delivered in Netherlands, uh, which is called um, You Decide Who You Are uh, or Who You Want to Be. That program has a sport component, which is very strong. It is developed and adapted to, to achieve certain, the development of certain skills, whether life skills, whether social skills, whether uh, confidence, whether resilience, whether leadership skills, but they also recognize that sports, the sports activities have a limited uh, spectrum. They have a limited set of, of results that they can generate. And if you want to, for instance, provide employability opportunity for the young people participating in a program aimed at reducing violence and crime, then it's the sports activities, yes, they are fundamental, they are essential, but through the sports activities in and by themselves, a young person is not going to learn how to write a, a curriculum vita. A young person is not going to learn where to go and look for a job. So they might develop all these skills, but they, they, 
they still have limitations to where they can put them into action. Uh, so complementary support, such as mentoring, counseling, very practical uh, vocational training or employability training would typically be some of the things that would make a strong program even stronger. Uh, successful violence and crime reduction programs that, that we are looking at typically um, make sure that, 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 that they focus on the similarities between gang group and, and sporting experiences meaning they don't introduce new very different ways of operating in a social space uh, they are meeting young people's need for belonging to a social space uh, they are meeting young people's need for status uh, for excitement but in a positive way so in that way they they kind of replace what otherwise gangs or group belonging in in those communities could provide for them Commitment to engage whole groups rather than individuals, uh, working with entrenched hierarchies rather than trying to displace them. Another important one, uh, you can take someone out of a social space for the delivery of the program, but what happens afterwards? They move back into the same social space. So you would want to, to try to influence the wider social context, context they're operating in. Uh, inclusion of peer mentors in the program, Rooting the program in the local sports com own local community and work with local organizations is critically important as well. So it's not seen as, 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 as an estranged foreign imposition on the community. And then obviously working very closely with education and career and career opportunities, as I said, for, for the young people involved. Uh, we do have indicators, uh, so we're we are not foreign to them. And some of the things we're looking at is certainly still gaining relevant life, social and vocational skills. It's for young people to understand the impact of violence or the impact of crime. It's to have confidence, emotional balance. It is to generally base, build resilience for young people in the face of difficulties of, of their lives in the social context in which they operate. Um, enjoying positive nonviolent relations and and improving the cultural awareness uh, of themselves, of the communities, of other people in the communities uh, that they're operating in as well. And then finally, <coughs> just a few numbers from our side. Uh, in general, we only count the participants who have an ongoing direct participation uh, in a program, meaning we don't count trickle down effects. We don't count indirect effects. Or we count them, but we don't report on them. Uh, the ones that are interesting for us are the participants who has this ongoing commitment, such as the, for instance, thousand young people in, in the program in the Netherlands. And we also typically look at both male, female and non-binary participants in, in these communities. Uh, across the board, 2019, we don't have 2020 results yet. We're only beginning to look into that now. But from 2019, we're looking at 325,000 people participating in programs across the world and having access to safe and inclusive spaces, which is a precondition for any kind of program delivery. Uh, 173,000 re reporting improved confidence in emotional balance, uh, 189,000 gaining relevant skills for the social life skills, and 83,000 enjoying positive, nonviolent, and constructive relationships with each other. Uh, between the 173,000 in improved confidence and the 83,000 in, in enjoying the positive and nonviolent and constructive relationship with each other, two, those two are linked. Um, but the first one is the one that has to do with knowledge, which one that has to do with, with looking inwards for the young people, whereas the other one has more to do with longer term or mid to longer term social action that comes from it. And that's why you see a, a bit of discrepancy in, in the numbers. Anyway, that's all I really wanted to do. Key message, support for development programs uh, and can be, can be, they don't have to be, but they can be extremely cost efficient. Uh, and it's certainly, while not being the only solution, uh, to crime and, and violence, it can certainly be a very cost efficient contribution to, to a political framework aiming at, at that particular thing. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing the screen and leave the floor to uh, Kelly. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, Martin. I think uh, uh, pointing out the cost effectiveness of sports programs, it has generated a lot of interest for many participants. Many will ask for your study, I think. Um, uh, but also thank you for pointing out uh, um, the need for complementarity and uh, support programs that they could build around sports interventions to increase impact. Uh, because uh, it comes from the research, it comes from the results in the field that uh, in order to sustain the, the, uh, the, the positive results of sport paid intervention and create also you know, a better perspective of young participants, you do need to um, attach to these other support programs. Uh, you mentioned mentoring, uh, for example, uh, as UNODC will also uh, promote uh, in a connection with the LENAPTA program, also parental skills programs, uh, and there are many more. So let's try again now uh, with uh, Kelly. Kelly, you can try without your headphones to see if it works, because when you first joined the meeting uh, before two, you had the same problem, and then you did something and it was fixed, the sound. So, do you remember what was wrong? Just really quickly, can you unplug the headphones, please, from the computer? Okay, you've up, you've unplugged them. Can you say something? No. Okay, can you go to the settings button, please? Okay. Right. Oh, now I can hear you. We can hear you. Ah, okay. Perfect. Thank okay. You. I, I did nothing different, but I'm glad that it's working. Um, it's working. Apologies, <laughs> colleagues, and thank you to. Uh, thank you. To, well, I'd like to resolve it because I think it is. Uh, you have very interesting uh, presentation. I think it, it's it's good for the participant also to hear from Fight for Peace. You have a long studying experience in this context, and it's great that we can have you with you and have your presentation. <laughs> Oh, sure. I'll, I'll try to be brief. So thank you, Georgia. Thank you, colleagues. Um, and I will try to not repeat what my other colleagues have said. I could just start by saying that I agree with, um, particularly with, with Ben and David. So what I'll try to do is to just give examples of how this has worked in Jamaica. I, sh I should clarify that I'm speaking on behalf of Fight for Peace and the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport here. And I think it will be an interesting illustration of how initiatives led by a grassroots actor and initiatives led by a state actor are sort of finding um, common ground in the middle. So as Georgia mentioned, Fight for Peace is a global NGO. We work specifically on youth violence and only work in communities where youth violence is a challenge um, with the intention of using sport as a way to address youth violence. Our program in Jamaica started in 2016 and it, it was in many ways an experiment. What we were trying to do was to see if we could achieve the same strong results that our two academies had achieved for two decades in Rio and one decade in, in London, if we could achieve that success in Jamaica, but using a different model, so using a, a collective impact approach. And, and I think it's important to clarify that, that we were investing in developing a model because it has really influenced the way that we have worked here. Um, so in terms of what that model has taught us about how to use sport, I think there are four key things that we would want to stress, um, and you've heard many of them already. One is sport has to be integrated with complementary holistic programs. We don't take a one sport approach. We don't take a one size um, fit all approach to sport, and we don't assume that sport can solve all problems. Um, in our model, uh, Fight for Peace has always accompanied sport with programs in education, employability, youth leadership and psychosocial support. In Jamaica, we've stuck to that, but it's been buttressed by community engagement programs and parental engagement programs. And I should also stress that because of the high levels of violence in the communities where we work, psychosocial support has been a, a key element of how we work. Um, the second key principle for us is that for sport to be successful, it has to be integrated into a public health approach in treating with violence, meaning that we have to have programs differentiated by risk level and prioritized at um, in communities and at sites where rates of violence are high. And I think um, it's important to clarify that so that we're, when we're talking about results, we're talking about um, uh, results that that, um, that map to the efforts that were made. So we often get um, questions about the validity of sports interventions by looking at 
what happened with the homicide rate during the period of time. Well, if the intervention wasn't decide, designed to address homicide or cited in a location where homicide is an issue, then obviously it's not going to have an impact on, on the homicide rate. So we really do try to, um, I think uh, Ben said it best, be intentional about our programming and very clear about mapping programming to, to places and cohorts where violence is a problem and that we are clear about the type of violence that we are trying to address by whom and, um, and, and where, as I said. The third key principle for us is collective impact. That's a framework that we use for our Jamaica program and that we're increasingly using in our work around the world. And that is a, a way of maturing the idea of collaborating, bringing multiple actors together around a shared framework, specifically a shared agenda and a shared monitoring and evaluation framework. There are other components of collective impact, but I think those are the two most relevant for us. Um, what that means for us in Jamaica is that we try to find the best in class partners to deliver that integrated set of programs on the far left. We work specifically with sport federations um, and sport based NGOs, but we try to make sure that we really have um, our sport delivery plugged into the national program for sport. And I can talk about that more later if there's time. Um, critically, it also means that there has to be an organization playing the role of backbone. I think we've heard this morning about the many different stripes um, that sports can take us down, paths that sports can take us down. Somebody needs to keep the whole network focused on why we're doing what we're doing. What is this all about? Are we trying to create a boxing champion or are we trying to reduce um, youth violence? Some, someone has to do all of that back end stuff, organize the training, make sure the quality of delivery is consistent across partners and consistent across sites, upskill the partners in monitoring and evaluation where necessary. There's a whole set of activities behind delivery that require dedicated attention. And that has been our, our uh, uh, the thing that we have noticed is most absent in other efforts that we've seen across the country here. There isn't that dedication to the back end um, a set of activities that can allow for scaling and replication. And the third, the fourth key principle for us is making sure that we are aligned um, at the local and national level with policy. For us, that's, that's particularly important because we're moving into communities where a lot of our delivery partners are not resident. Um, we are not a Jamaican NGO, so we have to make sure that we, we don't appear to be foreigners coming in with our new um, or different or culturally irrelevant way of working and that we are really trying to, to line up the work we are doing with what the government and community partners have decided is best for that community. And then we play, we have a 360 relationship with policy where we try to feedback what we have learned into re relevant policy and program development forums. Um, and for us, there are two interesting opportunities that have emerged. One is the work that the Ministry of Culture, Agenda, Entertainment and Sport is doing here, which I'll go into more detail on. And the second is in the time that we have been here, the government has created a national commission on violence prevention and one of the areas of exploration that that commission has been charged with is looking at sport as a way of reducing violence so that gives us a home for all our findings all our results and the opportunity to integrate that into policy and program design um, on the far right is are the three things that we try to keep in mind this is what we're working towards at the bottom we want to build a sustainable rec replicable model but we're also mindful that the the puzzle pieces that we're working with are, are young people, they're humans. And so we have to make sure that while we are working, we are generating improved outcomes for young people, as well as the organizations that work in those communities, the organizations serving young people in those communities so that we leave behind a stronger set of actors than we found when we started. Um, I, I will skip through this and, and I can pick up on it in the, in the interest of time, but I think what I wanted to talk about here is, is, the, is the, the work of the backbone organization in addressing the skills of the delivery partners and in ensuring policy alignment. Um, the things that we as Fight for Peace focus on are comprehensive sector mapping, maybe making sure that we have um, all of the key actors working on sport for development in our network in one way or another, that we co-design closely with community members and young people, the beneficiaries of the project, that we provide continuous capacity building, and that every pro program component that we introduce is owned by an anchor partner. So there is somebody who is going to take on that work after this program ends. 
Um, we, as I said, are, are very invested in monitoring and evaluation, and our approach is to use what we call a nested indicator framework, meaning that we're measuring multiple things at the same time. Um, we measure and report progress in terms of the individual beneficiaries, the organizing partners who, who deliver our programs, the communities in which we work, and progress as a collective. And that requires really tight collaboration with all of the state uh, ministries, department, and agencies, forgive my acronyms, um, so that we have the baselines and the incident rates that we need um, for our reporting. Where we are less strong is in getting academic institutional partners and research institutes involved for control studies so that we can triangulate the data as, um, as one of the speakers uh, mentioned earlier. Um, but the thing that we are most excited about that has emerged over the last three years is the National Monitoring and Evaluation Framework for Sport that the Ministry of Culture has developed which will allow us and all our partners to report what we are doing in the context of the government's broader plan for sport so the ministry has been working um, with partners including the commonwealth foundation i believe on a, a national m e system for sport that addresses all of sport we focus obviously on the sport for peace indicators um, which i will go through briefly here but the idea is to have all sport-based NGOs and federations and community-based organizations that use sport across the country reporting in the same way. So reporting on the percentage of population that has access to sport, but also down the road reporting that sport has a positive impact on creating a safe and secure society. Um, there are indicators for open access sport as well as sport at the secondary and tertiary level. I've got a minute, so I will uh, go through this. Um, we are working really closely with the Ministry of Sport to implement these indicators within our program. Um, and over the next year or so, we'll also be working with them to roll out training for sport federations and sport-based NGOs that will include improve their ability to report against these frameworks as well, and I, I can leave that um, with you to talk through later. Um, in terms of what we report, we we are able to report on the progress of the collective. So one of the key challenges that we identified is the is the the absence of a, a real sport for development sector in Jamaica. And over the time that we have been working, we've managed to pull in about forty different NGO, community, government, and donor partners who have been co-delivering using the collective impact framework for about three years. Um, our programs have reached this. These are pre-COVID numbers: um, young people at the primary, secondary, and tertiary risk levels exceeding twenty-five. Hundred um, and at the height of our delivery, we were doing seventy sessions a week in sport and complementary programming. Those are our reach numbers, but we also measure progressions in young people in terms of some of the personal development indicators that you've heard about um, earlier, and um, and also look at community engagement indicators as well. Where we are not as strong is integrating this with crime and security, crime prevention and security indicators, but we are hopeful that one of the things that will come out of the National Commission on Violence Prevention is that there will be a similar national citizen security framework that all actors in violence prevention will be able to report against. So I will leave it there, but happy to answer questions if we have time and my contact details are um, there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I will take with me from your presentation. I think everything was very interesting and relevant, of course. Uh, but I, I think it's good that you mentioned the need to tailor our intervention to the risk level uh, and have tailored activities for different group of people with different objectives, uh, not only contextualizing based on, on what's happening, but also you know looking into the profile of, of uh, people that we want to engage. So that is very important. And also, I want to um, mention um, the importance of having the, the commitment um, from a policy perspective, you know, when it comes to uh, scale up or sustaining um, uh, sports-based intervention. And it seems that in Jamaica, a lot is happening on this um, uh, in this sector and you are able to work, if I may say, hand in hand with the state actors um, to Im use sports in this context, but also measure impact and scale up this type of activities. And this will take me now to, we can still have 
I think 10 minutes for a Q, short Q&A. So I would like to ask Morten and Hilton to, to join us uh, and open their cameras and microphones. Uh, there are some interesting questions from, from the participants and one is indeed on the scaling up. Um, many point that, well, there are a lot said about sports-based intervention, but most of them, they're quite, you know, local, small scale programs how we can really scale up this type of intervention from local to national level and what could be the challenges you know that uh, states or you know you uh, may face in, in in this process it's just an issue of resources it should end more than very clearly said that you know sports-based interventions yeah they are cost effective compared to other but what are the other challenges. I mean, human resources, from our experience, if I may contribute in this, it can be an issue. Um, and that's uh, already pointed also through Ben's intervention. We need to invest in building capacity of trainers and uh, the, the, the human resources that are engaged in this activity. So from your experience, if you can very briefly say one to two, three key elements of scaling up and sustaining these activities. So, Martin, do you want to start? I can start, yeah. Um, well, definitely human resources. That, that's an important one. I think also a recognition that sports-based programs need complementary activities and scaling up more complex program design, such as the design that the Fight for Peace is delivering in Jamaica and in other countries. Uh, scaling up complexity is also a complicated one. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that it can't be done. I think also the sports development sector is, is very good at pushing its agenda, um, but also needs to look inwards because there are still huge challenges within sport for development. There are challenges on inclusion. There's challenges on gender justice. There are challenges linked to safeguarding. And especially over the past year, a whole new set of challenges has emerged around uh, engaging through virtual means. So let's look inwards before we start start just focusing entirely on scaling up and broadening uh, broadening the scope. Uh, Kelly, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I would I would disagree with Martin a little, um, um, but only um, sort of cosmetically. Um, I, I think it's important to look at scaling up before you start, and 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 I'm speaking specifically in the context of of a small country with limited resources. We are often appalled by the by the wasting of resources and the redundancy in efforts because actors have not communicated prior to implementation so oftentimes we we hear about a program um too late in its implementation or after it's concluded whereas there are synergies that could have been realized that could have resulted in greater impact for the beneficiaries or cost savings and if i think one of the key um one of the key opportunities is to, you, you know, you need a traffic cop. Somebody needs to decide where, where is it that we all want to go and then break up the work so that the work takes us, you know, collectively moves us forward. And that doesn't happen enough. We, we are lucky as an NGO to have really strong, positive relationships with all, all of the, the ministries, departments and agencies that we work with. But we find that they often don't have enough opportunity to connect with each other mm -hmm. um, so that even within the state, there isn't enough information about what the other um, what the other uh, relevant agencies are doing. And so I think that clarity in um, in policy direction, the clarity in in having a common definition of the problem, the clarity in having consensus around methodologies should precede even small implementations because then we are more, I think the, the, the word of the day is intentional. It makes us more intentional in how we use the limited resources that we have. And we, we um, you know, focus on trying the things that we need to try. So we, we have a massive evidence-based problem in Jamaica, but there isn't, um, Right now, there isn't a, a traffic cop saying, here are the top five things that we need evidence. And if you're going to implement a sport for development program in 2021, please try mm -hmm. to focus on these areas so that it will improve the knowledge base of, of the sector as a whole. So, I, yeah, I, I think that kind of, of integration should precede implementation, no matter how, how small the implementation may seem. 
Thank you, Kelly. And I keep also that we do need also uh, as a requirement to have a solid policy framework within these activities that have been implemented in order to be able to, you know, bring all partners together and work, you know, collaboratively to, to scale up and sustain these activities. But Chetan, from your, from your experience in, in Western Cape, uh, what were the challenges that you, uh, you know, encounter in, in in your efforts to to integrate sports in this broader uh, framework on violence and crime prevention and scaling up the implementation. Uh, uh, Georgia, I think the main thing is your strategic alignment to national and local um, priorities. Um, and with scaling up, I think that will come in where you can align your priorities with another organization or another department at the governmental level. As with us, we can scale up easily because of our relationship with the education department where we can use schools whose, whose infrastructure is already available, where we can provide programming at, at those points within the community. So I think the main point of scaling up is not trying to do everything yourself. Um, partnerships, collaboration is very important because there's lots of organizations doing the same work, but there's a kind of silo mentality happening and everyone wants to be the savior. So I think the best way to scale up is everyone strategic align everything they're doing and all work together towards uh, one goal which is behavioral change and prevention crime prevention and substance abuse prevention yeah okay this brings us to the other question about partnerships i think throughout the event today but also when i mentioned partnerships are essential um also in order to have more sustained intervention but also more comprehensive intervention that's you know through sports um, in this partnership, what's the role of sports sector that can play? And I would like to link it is also with the resources, since there is also this perception that oh, sports sector, particularly, you know, they, they have so many money and resources they should also invest or you know who can use. But a part of a funding source, what other role sports uh, sector can play in this uh, effort uh, for violence and crime prevention and if you can share some concrete examples of how you engage with the sports sector. So. I think oh, I think as a sports sector, um, we kind of have to know our role and know our part to play. Um, there are other institutions that, that address various other issues, which we do tap into. But as I said in my presentation, we still need to provide opportunities for mastery. So if you're giving life skills, um, activities using utilizing sport they still should be avenue towards mastery and not just in sports skills but also in other skills that they obtain because with regards to sustainability and motivation of participants if they're just coming to a life skills program it, it might seem short term but if it's a sport thing where they generally develop over the years and learn new set of skills each through each um, segment of, of activities then obviously they sustain while also um, adopting this mm -hmm. life skill that is um, incorporated into the because sports uh, sector. Uh, I may also add to this sports sector because, of course, as you are mm -hmm. a state uh, local government department on mm -hmm. sports, uh, but I would like to add also the let's say private sports sector, federation, sports clubs, or mm -hmm. competitive sports. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you are engaged with them, and yeah. to, to what uh, in, in which context, uh, I can easily yeah. think about the facilities, for example, and the infrastructure structure and how they could contribute in this. Uh, yeah. yeah, we work closely with um, with local federation, provincial federations within Western Cape. Um, obviously, their uh, priority is mainly competitive sport. Um, so mainly what we do, our relationship is that we, our programs will be mass participation. So we're creating a bigger pool for, for participants and obviously they will take over the next level activities, which is more skill based. But we, we are obviously pushing more uh, life skills component because also we are pushing athletes into a new environment without the relevant support systems or the, with the mm -hmm. capabilities to actually survive in within that space. So as I said, we are reaching out to other NGOs and other organizations to assist in that manner, especially with fast tracking. A, a lot of the federations and sporting entities are fast tracking individuals, especially with goals of transformation and, and gender um, equality but the relevant support systems is not available to those individuals. So we are, us as a governmental entity, we we only regulate the federations. We, we, it's tough to tell them what to do, but we do put in our efforts to make sure that those various support systems are in place to support athletes, which are coming from a more mass participation area, which is a life skills department, and which is obviously moving on to those next level activities. 
Thank you, Hilton Martin. From uh, Laurel's experience, I know you work quite close yeah. with the sports sector. Yeah, we do. I think there's a lot of different roles. Uh, as you could already hear in my presentation, they're an operational partner. Uh, engaging at the very local level, at community level with sports organizations is, is critical to get an anchorage and get an entry into to working, working in those communities. So at an operational level, they're very important as a donor. Well, sports sector is already very active as a donor. You have the FIFA Foundation, for instance, uh, supporting programs across the world uh, and a whole range of other foundations. And then I would say from a laureate's perspective, athletes themselves, uh, elite athletes. Uh, we work with the Laureus World Sports Academy, which is this pantheon of 70 retired top athletes, uh, finest of the finest. And we have about 200 ambassadors of, of still active, predominantly athletes. Um, they are not just there to use their platform. Uh, we engage them actively in the programs uh, across the world to share their stories, to stand as role models, to Mm -hmm. to, to, to share their own experiences with some of these vulnerable young people and at risk young people that, that enter into the programs, recognizing or help recognizing that, that even if you do have these kind of achievements that we're seeing from these athletes, then it doesn't mean that you're not struggling with some of the same issues that you are if, if you're, you're, you're just average Joe. Uh, or average modern living in a local community entering into this type of program. So role models, sharing experiences, providing content to these programs is important. Still facing the risk of potentially driving to, a bit too much towards promoting elite sports because that's not the idea. And none of our academy members, none of our ambassadors are there to promote elite sports. They're there to share experiences and, and it's working. No, I agree, but as we saw, also we do work also with athletes, basically through national living committees, and I think that contribution can be very vital in in acting, you know, in motivating young people, and you know, really, you know, pass through messages yeah. that are very important. The video that I saw before was also developed in partnership with national living committee and Olympic athletes. And um, it's just a small example how can be engaged, you know, in the program delivery and support our activities. But Kelly, uh, if you could also add on, on how you engage. Yeah, I was going to say, and I like the way you framed the question about the sports sector, because I think that's that's really the point of it, is to understand the the um, the, the dimensions within sport as a sector and to understand all the different ways in which partners can potentially contribute to that larger goal. So for example, we, you know, we go into communities and we put on what we call sticky programs. So our point is to be there at least twice a week so that, you know, young people can have an opportunity for an engagement with an adult that cares about them, um, learn discipline, positive, all, all, all the stuff that Morton said earlier. Um, but there are other there are other ways in which sport can help to contribute to, to reducing community violence that can happen in that twice a week model. So we have a partner called the Peace Management Initiative that uses sort of more impromptu opportunistic sports sessions as a way to reduce tensions within the communities or to reduce hostilities between um, groups in conflict in the community. The police also use sport in the same way, so more of an ad hoc um, violence interruption kind of approach rather than prevention. Um, the Social Development Commission, which is another state partner, has a schedule of sport-based community activities as a site as a, as a, a site yeah for community engagement for um, creating a capacity building for community-based organizations around something that is universally um, uh, interesting and, and sticky at the community level. So, uh, you know, and there are other pieces that we haven't done, like Morton um, mentioned, using the affinity for sports as a way of, of um, introducing young people in our programs to success narratives. Um, interestingly, the the our our view of of focusing on on sport, elite sports, has changed quite a bit. We were very intentional at the start that we were a sport for development program, but we we always deliver sport using the federation. And what we've noticed is that as Morton as Hill Hilton said, um, mastery has a massive impact on, on um, uh, personal progressions within our, our program, both the ability to see it. So for many of our young people, this is the first time they've, they've had an expert in something that they care about in their community space, sharing something with them that is attainable. And then that conduit, that ability to progress in 
in the sport at the national level has been for us, has had a massive impact on community engagement and, and also interestingly, parental engagement. So we've had kids in our program for two years that parents ne never cared, weren't involved. Kid goes to a tournament, ends up in a newspaper, all of a sudden a parent is tripping down the road to the community center. Now they want to get involved, right? So we so we've realized that there is that 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 a success culture has a place in moving the needle on some of the other things that we're trying to um, trying to move. And so there's space for that within the, the broader sport for development priorities. Um, as long as it's delivered by that best in class partner, complemented by programming that meets the other needs of young people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yale. I'm a little bit cautious of the time because we have exceeded for uh, a little bit uh, and we have interpretation service that they have to leave us soon. But uh, just the last question that I would like to, a very short answer. It comes from any participant, how we adapt to COVID. Um, as, as a line at Liva program, of course, we're using online you know, in technology to have online sport challenges for more sports within the COVID era as a way also for well-being and addressing stress, anxiety, you know, for young people, but also families, um, also focusing on a raise awareness campaigns and different, you know, uh, also pointing out to the increased risks because of the COVID and the confinement um, and the social impact that this has into uh, young people and communities. These are some of the ways, but if you can just sort of say one or two successful ways that you have adapted your programs, because then we have to move with the closing, but it's something that many, many people ask. So let's leave the challenges and focus on what has worked from what you have done. So Martin? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think there is a third thing you didn't mention. One, well, there are a couple of things you didn't mention. One, uh, yes, secondary effects of the pandemic, they need to be addressed. Uh, mm -hmm. Two, um, we need to make sure that uh, kids are still active, uh, not just about addressing secondary effects, but once restrictions are over, kids need to be active again. Uh, so there is a transitioning phase at the end of this. And then we need to make sure that, that organizations are around. So together with Beyond Sport, Laureus Sport for Good launched the Sport for Good Response Fund and ended up providing 90 grants to organizations to one, survive the crisis and to adapt their approaches to to delivering their programs, which of course is a huge, huge challenge for organizations that are used to jumping into the cricket pitch or, or running in the on a, running in the running tracks or going into the boxing ring. Uh, so adapting, adapting, adapting. And from our perspective, not delivering directly programs on the ground, um, that has been critically important uh, to see how the, the sector has evolved. And our next annual review will reflect some of that. But I would very keen on hearing what Kelly is doing in. Jamaica. It, it's not great. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, we COVID has has worsened all the inequities that were there before. So we've we've, you know, in theory, successfully transitioned our programming online, but we're very mindful that that leaves behind a good chunk of our kids who don't have access to data or devices on a regular basis. And we've we've managed to negotiate with our donors to allow us to meet some of those needs, but it's not the same as um as having that face-to-face -face contact. So now we're trying to um, to remix our sports at distance. Um, so we're, we're developing a, a combat sports-based um, non-contact um, version that's more challenge-driven that we hope to roll out this um, quarter. But what we have really tried to, to hang on to is the what, what was at the core of the engagement in sports. So outside of the physical sport, it was that contact with the with a coach. It was that con our sports are delivered in a triangulated way. So there's always a member of the community and a psychologist or social worker present. And we've tried to replicate the the the, the intention of a sports session in non-contact ways. So making sure that we follow up with our young people and that we meet their emerging needs in different ways but really holding on to the engagement which is the which is really what what matters thank you kelly um i think this uh, will be a very interesting area of uh, research from our researchers to see effectiveness of this online uh, sports uh, but not only sports or other educational activities within the the pandemic uh, era that would be very interesting to research and see what it work at the end, because we're all trying to do our best, but without really knowing, you know, what uh, what is the impact of of uh, all this uh, uh, new uh, way of working with the young people. So Hilton, I know you also have a lot of challenges. 
something that you tried and works well uh, in order to close and pass the floor to Marco for closing the meeting? Yeah, as Kelly said, in Africa, the same thing. Uh, COVID has highlighted in inequities that's within communities and resources such as data and devices are very scarce within the communities we work in. So that's where our coaches have really stood up within the communities. They have assisted with feeding in the communities. They've assisted with schools that reopened, with screening, taking the load off the educators. Um, but the main thing that they have done, they have kept close contact with the participants or the, the, of the program within their community because they come from the community that the participants are in. So it's either via WhatsApp, which seems like the most um, openly available platform that we can commu communicate to participants, sending um, YouTube links or, or pictures or just talking them how, how they are. So the relationship they've built with the participants has been vital during this time. So it just showed that through all um, intervention, policy plan, the actual coach is the main driver and we should never forget that. And COVID has really highlighted that to us as a as department that these are really our main resource and our most important that we should protect them and empower them. So I think the success story is actually our coaches and the involvement during this tough time that we've, uh, we've just gone through. I think this is a very nice way for closing our meeting today. I mean, uh, praising the, the role and contribution of, of uh, each uh, individual sport uh, coach or community worker that they are making this happen because uh, we all know that this is, you know, the key element for success of any of uh, these type of interventions. So uh, thank you all for, for the session today, for the interesting presentation, but also for this uh, nice discussion um, for our participants. Then uh, it's time to close the meeting. Uh, so I would pass the floor to Marco for closing remarks. And thank you all the participants for staying with us. Uh, we have more than 360 participants, as I said, this exceeded our expectation, but it's also so the interest in this area and how much uh, more we can do. And we hope that this is a start for our engagement. So Marco, floor is yours. Thank you, Georgia, and thank you to all our panelists that made this event so valuable, so, so interesting, and also for the participants that are keeping with us and participating and engaging and seeing the messaging on the chat. And I think this is very reassuring of the future. I have the hard task to put some takeaways on this closing, which means that I will capture the main ideas, some elements of so many valuable elements and interesting elements and experience on impact, on areas of impact and how can we progress better. So thank you to all of our esteemed panelists for their sharing and their willingness to live with us some of their experiences and uh, some of their lessons learned. So a uh, main takeaway I would start is that actually sports has naturally the potential to effectively contribute to lowering youth crime, violence and drug abuse. Uh, the impact of sport-based intervention is very linked and it was, was mentioned for several of the participants and the speakers, the, the impact is very linked on the way the interventions are designed and implemented to be very contextualized to the place they are taking uh, and the communities they are trying to address. And our speakers underline that during today's presentations. The importance also of promoting crime prevention practices based on a very solid evidence informed community analysis or social analysis in the context they will be implemented which naturally from our perspective will include a clear and solid theory of change what we want actually to achieve and to reach that uh, social behavior change to conduct a very solid monitoring and evaluation of the interventions that are designed and obviously adjust whatever needs to be adjusted to reach the end goal and the most success possible. For that objective, I think from our side, from UNODC side, from the side of the global program, we will continue to work with all of you uh, to develop guidelines, tools, and to promote a platform to share good practices, to effectively use and integrate sports as a tool for crime prevention. And obviously to continue to build community resiliences and obviously build on the evidence that we are being collected. It is from our perspective also, uh, necessary to continue to promote sports and other education and social programs for youth as part of a broader holistic crime prevention strategies and policies, I would say. 
not only to prevent youth from victimization, but also engaging youth as active engines of change. Our communities and obviously our societies aim to achieve the sustainable development goals and objectives, and that needs necessarily to have community and youth engagement as actors of change and positive change, I would say. I don't want to ignore a um, fact as in the top of our societal change, which is the COVID-19 effect. Had an impact in the planned activities involving sports as a tool for crime prevention. But I think we have listened different ways how to adapt to the current context and continue to maintain the programmatic relevance of these interventions. And of course, finding creative and innovative ways to implement still sport-based interventions. Uh, for my side, allow me a very personal load. As coordinator of the DOA Global Program, I am very proud to see the results that our youth crime prevention through sports initiative has produced on the ground. We have seen the importance of actively engaging youth through sports, through the correct partnerships that some of you are in this call. So a big thank you to you. And you have seen also how sports can increase the sense of belonging, can be used to promote values and change attitudes that to actually support young people to become responsible citizens and actors in their own communities. Make positive choices, make assertive life choices is a, a, something that these initiatives can also promote and stimulate. When facing the reality of communities with high levels of violence and also difficult choice for our youth members. To achieve these results, I think it's also one takeaway. It's the need to have a cross-sectoral partnership that must also promote the sharing of good practices from around the world and understand how we can design sports-based interventions that will have actually a positive effect and impact on the communities. These alliances and finding the right partnerships are obviously important to, to sustain and scale up results and this is, and the potential is obviously always there. Moving forward, from our side, from UNODC side, as it was mentioned, the General Assembly Resolution 74-170 on sports and crime prevention will continue to promote and be part of our promotion, our work, to integrate sports into youth crime prevention and obviously criminal justice strategies. Therefore, we'll continue to work supporting member states to build better societies by effectively integrating sports-based programs such as Line Up Live Up, as well as other sport development programs into their national and local frameworks for crime prevention, prevention of violence, and also substance abuse. It is for us critical that such programs are institutionalized in order to ensure mid and long term sustainability. Responding to member states requests for targeted interventions and acknowledging to reach out to more vulnerable groups, it's the aim and we aim to continue to develop new tailored guidance tools, how to use sports to prevent violence and to promote social reintegration. And of course, we will count on all of you in your experience to be able to compile those good plans best practices into something that can, can constitute positive guidelines to implement this type of programs. Also, I think it, it's one of our aims to continue to step up the efforts of the prevention of violence through and within sports by further promoting multi-agency approach and strengthening partnerships and the cooperations with the sports sector itself. And if this was part of the last discussions that we, we have heard before I start speaking, Okay, we think from our side and all together we can all, all continue to have and see value on this engagement. Prevention of radicalization and violent extremism through sports is another area that potentially we would like together with all of you to expand our work footprints and tailor some interventions for the near future. There are, of course, some of our future priorities continue to brainstorm with you innovative evidence sport based approaches to prevent youth violence and of course 
we are very grateful also to the state of Qatar for the support and allowing us to continue to program towards the future and continue to work with all of you. Let me once again reiterate UNODC commitment to support governments in making the world a better place, a safer place, to engage and invest in young people through sports and other effective and innovative youth-based initiatives. And of course, to continue to both of you build solid partnerships with key actors in the different societies. Before two sentences for me to finish this intervention, of course, a big thank you to my wonderful team, Georgia, Lucia, and the rest of the team that is in the back stage of preparing these events. Of course, with you, we can always build and continue to build with them. And finally, it was a pleasure to share this virtual space with all of you today. And a special, obviously, thank you to our panelists for being with us and willing to share their experience and their vision. So, and to our participants, see you next time. Thank you, George, over to you. Uh, thank you, Marco. I also want to thank the participants and the speakers, of course, for staying with us, and also Lucia and Safa that supported this event. And just before closing, to remind you that there is a recording in uh, the four different languages that will be available on our website in the coming days. And we're going also to follow up with you with a small survey on the events that we would like to ask you to reply in order to be able to improve uh, this online event since we're all uh, living in this world now with online events. But this will be your feedback very, very valuable for us to, to make these events more, more impactful and more useful for the participants. So thank you all and um, see you in the next event because yeah, physically maybe uh, we'll have to wait a little bit, I think. So thank you all.